on random numbers. Um, and we talked about uh, pseudo random number generators in the beginning. Then uh, last week there was a little interrupt in the pseudo random numbers and we went to uh, generating real random numbers based on the physical processes and I talked about my sabbatical with the Maxdoor hard disk company and showed you uh, that actually any hard disk in a computer is the perfect device to generate real random numbers because there is physics inside, there is physical noise which produces real random numbers and second but most importantly uh, we do have all the electronics we need to filter the random numbers. Oh, no, let's start. We first need um, an amplifier to amplify the noise, um, an analog amplifier, then an analog digital converter, and then we need a computer to maybe filter the random numbers, and everything is inside such a hard disk. So, in order to get real random numbers on your computer, you don't need to buy any special purpose hardware. You just use a hard disk with such a real random number generator on it and uh, then you get perfect random numbers with high speed. Oh yeah, maybe I forgot. So in, in that project we did, uh, at the end we could produce up to 800,000 random bits per second, which is quite good. Huh? Uh, I mean, it might even be improved a little more. Um, yes, and what we also did in this project, we filed two patents, but unfortunately, oh yeah, I, I, I told you already, unfortunately, Maxtor did not exploit these patents because it didn't bring them extra money. Huh? It only would bring a benefit for the user but, and, and this of course should be an issue for our Maxtor, but it is not because the users, they don't want high quality random numbers because they are, for example, not interested in security on their computers. Um, so as soon as security gets a real issue, then things will change and then such patents will be exploited but still it's not yet a real issue. Maybe terrorists have to be a little bit more active in the computer world and then it gets a serious issue. Uh, but I mean they will. Uh, okay, so now uh, we get back to random number generation and I will show you a quite it's, meanwhile, it's almost historic, uh, a historic way to produce uh, pseudo-random numbers, but it's, it's quite popular and a, a quite a nice mechanism. So give me like 20 to 30 minutes to talk about linear feedback shift registers. Okay, um, yeah, maybe we, we, we go immediately into the example. Um, so what we, what we do is, we have a number of registers. I mean, this is really like on the on the micro uh, on the um, uh, uh. what is the digital technique in English? Digital circuits. Uh. It's like on digital circuits. Um, so we have uh, storage elements containing bits. For example, these. Uh, registers contain a one bit here at this moment and we call them x1, x2 and x3 and now because it's a shift register it, at every clock cycle the bits will be shifted to the right and the rightmost bit will be output so this will be given to the user as a pseudo random bit maybe. Yeah? Okay, and now it's called a feedback shift register. 
So there is a feedback and here we have such a feedback loop and here and maybe also here. And here in this example this particular 3-bit shift register uh, does a feedback of this bit number 3 and number 2 and here they are uh, XOR connected and so uh, what we get here as the feedback is the XOR of X3 and X2. Huh? So if we start initially with this configuration that's what we see here after one cycle we get as a feedback 1x or 1 which is 0 and so this bit x3 in the next time, time step is 0 and the output is I mean the previously bit number 1 is now the new output and then in the second step this bit is the output and we get 0 x or 1 which is a 1 as the new x3 and so on up to here and now you, you already see that this is not a perfect random bit generator. Why? Because the next line would uh, start a period? So yeah. Because the period is very short. The period length is now, is here, 3. Which doesn't give you really good random bits. Huh? Um, yes, and uh, so the next bit always uh, depends on the previous state, just on one previous state. Um, and so the maximum period here with uh, 3 bit would be 8. Huh? We cannot have a longer period than 8 because the state of the register is 3 bit, which is 8 different states. So, um, yeah. And also there is one kind of forbidden state which is all zeros. If we would start with all zeros here, what would happen? Zero x or zero is a zero, um, so nothing would change, so we would have a sequence of all zeros. Huh? Um, so the number of allowed states is only seven and thus the maximum period would be seven. But this is of course uh, even much smaller than the maximum period. Okay, now, now let's look at the definition. Um, okay, I mean we don't have to look at this, maybe this is important. A linear feedback shift register computes the new input, it's called IN, by modulo 2 addition of certain bits of the register. Certain bits of the register. So it may be these two or these two or these two or even all three. These are the, the possible combinations. And of course we can have more than three bits. I mean three bits is too short. Huh? But if we would use uh, uh, 32 bits for example then we immediately see that there is an upper bound on the, per uh, the period which is um, 2 to the power 32 minus 1 uh, which is quite long. Um, so it might be possible with long uh, registers to produce good random numbers. But we will see the limitations in a minute. Yeah, now if we look at this uh, shift register where we have the XOR of bit number 3 and 1, then you see if we start with three ones, then we get a period of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, which is maximum. 
Okay, yeah, and now I show you that uh, linear feedback shift registers are not really, uh, uh, really secure. Um, okay, and I show you how to crack such a shift register. And the attack is quite easy. The assumption is that we don't know the structure of our register. So we don't know about this internal structure. Um, and we want to determine these coefficients a1, a2 and a3. Um, what, does, what does it mean to have such coefficients? Look, I already told you that we may have a feedback of of this bit number one, bit number two, and bit number three. This, these three feedbacks, they may be there or not be there. And if, I mean, if there is this connection, then A1 is one, otherwise it's zero. And the same with these two. So we can write um, the, the feedback function like that. A1 times X1, this is the product of this bit times A1, X are connected to A2 times X2, and again X, X are uh, connected to A3 times X3. And the result of this is what we feed back. Huh? So the new, you see, when we start in this state, then the new state for the new x3, you see this is what we have before the comma here. This is the new value of x3, uh, one time step later. Then x3 will be shifted in this position and x2 will be shifted in this position. Okay? And now we have uh, this function with these uh, three unknowns. And it is a linear function. Yeah? It's a linear function modulo 2. So we are doing modular arithmetics, but it's linear and we can, we can do mathematics as we are used to it, just by always applying the modulo operator. Okay, yeah. Um, and now, suppose we observe a sequence of bits. These bits are not internal states of the register. These are the output bits that the, the register gives us from time to time. Look like these. So we just observe um, the stream of output bits. Um, yeah. And here we have such a stream of output bits. How many are they? Two, four, six, eight. These eight bits, that's what we observe. Huh? This is the first bit we observe, then the second, third, and so on. Okay, again here our output stream and now for each time unit we can write down an equation. And here we have it. This is the state of our register. 1, 1, 1 is equal to A2 plus A3, 1, 1. So, uh, yeah, let's see. Um, Let's see the restart. Yeah. So we have to think if, if this is the state of our register, then the first output will be a zero, then we will get a one as an output and a one as an output. So if we observe this sequence, then uh, the initial state is this one. 
okay? And then uh, at the ni next time step, it will output a zero. Huh? It will output a zero and uh, these two bits, x1 and x2, will be both 1. Yeah? yeah, and we will know that at the next time step we should have, what should we have here? Oh, we don't, uh, I mean, it depends on, on the, the a's. Yeah? Okay, so you see, this is what we have at the beginning, then at the next time step we will have the two ones here. Huh? And uh, here we get A2 plus A3. Why? Because at the first time step X3 was 1 and X2 was 1, 2. So we have 1 times A2 plus 1 times A3 here. And you see that here now we have an equation um, for these two unknowns, A2 plus A3. Actually, we have this one equation, A2 plus A3 is equal to 1, which we write down here. Um, and then at the next time step, um, what do we get here? We get, why do we get, oh yeah, we get, look, these are our three ones here. Huh? And now uh, we get a zero in x3, which is here. So we have zero, one, one. And here we have, because here we had three ones in the state before, we get the combination of all the a's. All a's multiplied with one x1 times a1 plus x2 times a2 plus x3 times a3 and all the x's are 1 and that's why we have this here. And this leads to the next equation, this sum is equal to 0. Okay, and now we get a feedback of these two bits. These two bits are um, x1, which is 1, times a1, plus 1 times a2, is what we get here. And this is equal to 0. And that's why we get this equation. And now we are finished. Why are we finished? Because now we have three equations for three unknowns. And that's all we need. Of course, these uh, three, the left-hand sides of the three equations have to be linearly independent. Um, but, I mean, it's easy to see that they are linearly, linearly independent. These two equations are linearly independent. These are independent of each other. And, yeah, we cannot pr produce from a sum of these two guys this equation. Or can we? Let me see. No, it's not possible. Yeah. Okay, and now we have to solve this uh, system. So, um, First thing which is easy is we can substitute this first equation into the second one and then we immediately get um, 1 plus a1 is equal to 0 uh, so this means a1 has to be a 1. Um, and now we substitute this into the last equation and we get a2 plus 1 is equal to 0 which means a1 is a 1, 2. Um, and now we substitute this into 
this equation here and we get a 3, so we get a 2 is a 1 uh, and 1 plus something is equal to 1 this means a 3 has to be 0 and so now we know the structure of this uh, shift register which is this so we have the feedback from these two bits and we can, we can look at the sequence that's what we get okay and uh, yeah now let, let's look how many bits did we need um, from our sequence so we actually needed um, let me see do we one, two, three, four, five. Did we do we really need these five bits? Yes, we need, yeah, we need uh, these four bits and then we get this zero here and then we get this zero here. Yeah, we need We actually need six bits, yeah, we need six bits, yeah. Yeah. And here we will see that this is true in general. Um, okay, it can be shown that for analyzing lin linear feedback shift registers at most two n bits are required of the output sequence. Yeah? Um, and n is uh, 3 here, so we need 6 bits. I mean, here for such a tiny register, um, we almost need, I mean, 2n is equal to 2 power n minus 1, uh? no, minus 2. Uh? So it's almost the full, uh, the maximum length. Um, but if n gets larger, then 2n is tiny compared to 2 to the power n. Okay, yeah. Um, and, and this algorithm that we used here, I mean this of course can be implemented in general and can be applied. It's the so-called Berlekamp-Masse algorithm um, to, crack, to crack any uh, pseudo-random number sequence. I mean you can try to apply this algorithm and maybe it works and maybe you can represent your pseudo-random number generator by a linear feedback shift register even though maybe it's not generated uh, from a, a shift register but from some different process but you can apply this algorithm and try to crack such a sequence and then you can test it and see whether the future bits will be predicted okay and that's why we define the linear complexity of a sequence of bits is the length of the shortest linear feedback shift register that can generate uh, the result. And this is, I mean, 
this, of course, reminds us of Kolmogorov complexity. Why? Because Kolmogorov complexity is the length of the shortest program that can produce a random number sequence. And here we have the same thing, just that our computational model is much simpler. Uh, the computational model is a linear feedback shift register and so we can define the linear complexity of a sequence as the length of the shortest uh, shift register. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, so much about uh, linear feedback shift registers. It's just to, to know that there is this simple model and also this notion of linear complexity. Are there any questions? Okay, so then we are finished with our random number chapter. And yeah, we will go to a yeah, kind of unconventional chapter. Um, I will talk about calculation of means and application to functional equations. Sorry for this headline being not readable here. Um, I mean, here we will introduce two uh, important principles. The one is calculation of means, which is, of course, basic in statistics. And maybe you also have in the past asked yourself, why are there so many different mean functions? I mean, there is the arithmetic mean. You all know about the definition. There is the geometric mean, there is the harmonic mean, there is the, the quasi-arithmetic mean. Do you, do you know other means? The median. There is the median, yes. Yeah. Actually, there are infinitely many possibilities for mean functions. Uh, this notion of a quasi-arithmetic mean involves some parameters and each one of these parameters can have infinitely many different values. Uh, so, and, and now, of course, the question is, for a certain application, which one of these means should you use? And there was in the, 19, in the late 1980s, in the communications of the ACM, which is the most popular um, um, magazine about computer science in the United States. Yeah, in this, ACM is the Association of Computing Machinery, the American uh, the, uh, that's what in Germany is the GE, Gesellschaft für Informatik, in America, and their magazine is the, uh, they do have the journal of the ACM and the communications of the ACM. They have two journals. And in the communications of the ACM, there was a lengthy uh, debate about how to measure the speed up of computers. This was at the time uh, when uh, risk processors came up. Huh? And uh, then they tested the performance of these risk processors using benchmarks. Huh? And of course, these companies like Sun Microsystems, they wanted to sell their risk processors. They used some benchmarks and published results like this risk processor is on average has a speed up of two compared to the Intel processor. Uh, and then these guys from Intel, they came up with different benchmarks and published different results. Uh, like our Intel is a factor of two faster than the, the Sun Microsystems Spark processor. And then mathematicians came up 
and thought about what's going wrong here. How did they calculate the speed up and how did they calculate the speed up? And it turned out, it turned out that they all use the same formula actually. But there is a formula which you can use to, to cheat anybody. You can produce any result you want with this formula. And this is of course, I mean, this is the real tool for the marketing people. Huh? Because you can sell whatever you want, it's always the best uh, product. Huh? So maybe this is now a lecture about marketing and how you can cheat your customers. Huh? Um, but it's also a lecture for you as a customer to see how they cheat you and how you can uh, detect whether you're being cheated or not. Um, and it's a purely mathematical solution. Huh? Um, and the procedure will be the following. We will first look at these problems these guys had with their computer benchmarks. From these problems we will determine properties that such a speed up function needs to have. And then we will write down these properties and prove, mathematically prove, that there is only one good solution. And this one good solution will determine objective results and you won't cheat your customers anymore. That's the procedure we will, we will follow now. Yeah. Um, yeah, and something missing. Let's start. Okay, so suppose there is... Um, I want to compare three computers. You see this is from the time of maybe 1990 something. It might be 19... 94 or 5, something like that. There was the SunSpark Classic. I mean, this was really kind of a revolution. That's the first time where you had such really tiny little computers on your desk called workstation. Not just PC, but workstation. Um, I had such a computer in, on my desk. And that's because this guy is now our reference machine. And I consider buying a better computer. And it might be a Pentium 90 something or an HP 9000 something workstation. And now this is the guy on my desk and I might consider buying one of these. And now what I do is I take my favorite program which of course for such a professor who gives lectures all the time is LaTeX. Yeah? And, uh, and I measure the time of LaTeX on some benchmark. A huge document like our math script. Yeah, and at that time compiling a math script might have taken 10, ten seconds. Yeah? On my computer A. On computer B it takes maybe 8.1 seconds and on computer C 7.9 seconds. And now I calculate the speed up which is just the ratio of my reference time divided by the other times. Yeah? And of course reference time divided by reference time gives me a 1. I mean my reference system is the same as my reference system. And this guy is faster. So we get a speed up greater than 1. And this is even a little bit faster so the speed up is a little better. Okay. I mean, so far everything is fine, um, but this wouldn't be sufficient because sometimes I also use different programs, not just LaTeX. I use the C compiler, I use Mathematica, whatever. Yeah? Um, so maybe we should take the times of three different benchmarks on my computer. Um, yeah, I mean, if I take now my benchmark number two, 
and I calculate the times, I may get these. And then here, computer B is slower, uh, and computer C is a little bit faster. So you see the results are different. I mean, and the, I mean, the thumb marketing guys, they would just use their favorite uh, benchmark on their new computer. Um, but what these guys did, they, I mean, they did it a little smarter. Of course, they want to publish their results and say, okay, look, we have a representative set of benchmarks and we average over all these benchmarks and that's why our computer is proven to be the better one. And that's what we are going to do now. Huh? Um, so now, in order to make things simpler, we will compare only two systems, computer A and computer B. Of course, we can do it with computer C too. Two computers and three benchmarks. We call them I1 through I3, like instance, instances of applications. Okay, and we get the running times in seconds. One second, two second, 100 seconds on computer A, and on computer B we get 2, 4, 47. Now what we do is we compute T bar, the, the average time over the three benchmarks, which is 103, the sum of these divided by 3, which gives us 34.3. And uh, the average of these three is 17.7. .7. And now, we take the ratio of these two guys, which is 1.93. And so it's easy to see that computer A is almost twice as good as computer B. You're laughing? Are you, are you not happy with this result? Why are you not happy? In two of the three cases, computer A is faster than computer B. Yeah. On two benchmarks, computer A is twice as good as computer B. So now the question is, which one is the better one? And the answer, of course, is it depends. It depends on what? Um, it depends on whether you are an ordinary PC user or whether you are the, the leader of our Rechenzentrum, of our computing center here. Suppose in the Rechenzentrum there is a big server, like a database server, a file server, um, then this is the right formula. Then this is perfect. Why is this formula good? Because at the end of the day, this leader of the computing center, the provider of the server, um, wants to provide to the average user um, extremely fast response times. And the major part of the response time is waiting times. I mean, there is this server and there is a queue. There is a queue in front of the server. So, we have this server S and then there, there is a, a queue of jobs waiting to be processed in the server and out comes the results. Um, and of course, the provider of this server wants to have a throughput which is as high as possible. And when is the throughput high? I mean, this goes into 
performance evaluation and there are lectures about this topic and, and you have to of course do the, the, the skewing theory and mathematics behind this. We won't do that. There is a simple result. If suppose in 24 hours, um, I mean you know the typical amount of tasks that arrive during 24 hours. And you also know the average time it would take to process this one and this one and this one and so on. So you can just take the sum of all these times that come along on average every day and then it would be good if your server would have the power to process all these in 24 hours. If not, we are having a serious problem. What is then the problem? The problem is that this Q will increase linearly from day to day. So the Q is getting longer and longer and longer and the waiting time will increase. It will go up to years. Um, okay. So now the, the question is, we might naively think this server is appropriate as soon as the sum of the times in, uh, of these jobs in 24 hours is smaller than 24 hours. So if it could solve all these jobs in 23 hours, everything is fine. Because at the end of the day, it has processed everything. But, but, what is the but here? Suppose the, uh, the load here is 23 hours and we have 24 hours of time. And suppose you are one of the users and maybe you are this guy here. This may cause you a waiting time of 23 hours in the worst case. Suppose all these jobs arrive at 6 o'clock in the morning today at the same time. And then it will take you 23 hours for this job being processed even though it only takes 2 seconds. And then the performance for you as a, as a customer is not good at all. So now what's the desire of the provider of this server? Because this provider wants to have happy customers. about buying a faster server? A server that is twice as fast on average of these bench benchmarks. And then for you as the last job here, this would take only 11 and a half hours of waiting time. And if on average it's, it is 10 times faster, then it takes you only 2.3 hours. That's so easy. And now you see why it makes sense to calculate the sum of the times of all your benchmarks. Suppose these are is the set of my benchmarks. A representative set of benchmarks. And representative means that's what we have every day on our server. So you just take the sum of the times of all these benchmarks and that's what we have on computer A and here is what we have on computer B. So computer B definitely 
is the best at the better server. No? It's by far the better server. Because the average load is only half as high as the load of the, the, the other computer. Okay, and that's why this formula for calculating a speed up, I call it the operator speed up. Because this is the good formula for the operator of such a server. But it is not a good formula for you as a PC user. Why is it not good for you as a PC user? That's why you were laughing. Because on two of three benchmarks, it takes you twice as much time to wait. Look, the, a PC is extremely different. On such a server, there may be an average load of above 50% over one day. Not much above 50%. Because if we are getting close to 100%, then the waiting times accumulate dramatically. But do you know what is the, the average um, load of a typical P PC in percent? Who knows that? A PC running all day, I mean, not about just switching it on for 10 minutes and then switching it off. Suppose there is a person working eight hours a day in the office with a PC. During these eight hours, what is the average load of the PC? It's extremely small. I mean, it's, it's in, in the area of 1% or even less. And this means there is almost never a queue of jobs on your PC. You just start a job and then it's really about the, these real times. And then it matters whether you wait two seconds or four seconds. And of course you would, would prefer the PC where you have only uh, two seconds of waiting time. So you see for you, as the user of a PC, you want to look directly at you want to look at these ratios. You want to look at these ratios. Here the ratio is one half. Here it's one half and here it's two. Okay, yeah. Um, now le uh, let's look at two definitions. I mean this is trivial, it's just the definition of the arithmetic mean. Yeah? Um, and now we have the first speed up definition. Um, we call the, the times of computer A alpha 1 through alpha n and, and the times of computer B beta 1 to beta n on these benchmarks I1 through IN. Then the speed up is defined as the arithmetic mean of the times of computer 1 divided by the arithmetic mean of the times of the computer B. And then you see this 1 over N cancels out because N is the same and then we have just the sum of the times on computer A divided by the sum of the times of computer B. And that's what I would call the operator speed up. Okay, so for the operator this is fine, everything is good. But for the typical user, here we now uh, rather we want to calculate the sum of the ratios instead of the ratio of the sums. Look, here we have the ratio of two sums. And that's what we did not like here in case we are a user. As a user we want to look at the individual ratios. So we first take all the ratios and then calculate the mean. Okay, let's do that. Yeah? 
This is our definition to uh, speed up number two comparing two such computers is the arithmetic mean of all these ratios. And this is the formula. 1 over n sum over alpha k over beta k. Okay, and now we apply this to our example. S2 of computer A and computer B is the arithmetic mean of 1 half, 1 half and 100 divided by 47. Okay, so this is the sum of these three numbers which gives, I mean this gives 1 um, plus, this is a little bit more than 2 so we get a little bit more than 3 divided by 3 gives 1.04 Okay, now get, let's go back to, uh, in this example using the new speed up formula we get a speed up of 1.04 and this means computer A is a little bit better. Or is this? Yeah. Let me see. Um, yeah. So computer A is a little bit better than computer B. But now let's double check. What we now do is we exchange the two computers. So what we do is if we go back to this uh, table here, we exchange the two rows. So now suppose it would be just the other way around. And the result should be, if it would make sense, the result here should not be 1.49. It should be the inverse of this number. I mean, if computer, let's take a simple example, if computer 2 is twice as fast as computer 1, then how much faster is computer 1 than computer 2? It's half. Huh? But look, now the result is, I mean, isn't it funny? If you take, if you uh, do it like that, so if you're the owner of computer A and compare this to computer B, then your result is my computer is a little better than the other one. But if you're the owner of computer B and compare this with computer A, then your result is my computer is much faster than the other one. But in both cases, if you are the marketing guy, you can be happy and tell your customers, my product is better. And you use the same formula, just that the, your reference system is the different one. But I mean, that's okay. You are comparing your product with the one from the competitor. So, you see here we have a problem. And actually, I mean, maybe I should tune these numbers a little bit such that we get uh, like a 1.5 here and here. Yeah? That's also possible. We will see such examples. We will actually in a few minutes see an example where your computer is five times as fast as, a, as the one of the competitor and the other way around too. So you're five times faster than, than the other guy. Um, yeah. Even though the two are th the same. <laughs> What's the problem? Yeah, here we identify the problem. This is our problem. If we take S2 of system A compared to system B, then this should be the reciprocal of S2 apply to CB, CA. If we exchange the two system, then this should be the inverse. So we actually would like to have an equal here, but we don't have it. You see, we exchange the two systems, 
and this is not 1 over this. That's the problem. Yeah, and uh, what's the reason for this problem? Maybe we look into this calculation here and this calculation here. I mean, one half is the inverse of two. This two and this two. So these individual ratios are inverse. But, I mean, the problem is that here this ratio has such an extremely high weight compared to the others. I mean, these guys, they just vanish. Yeah. And if we, if we, I mean, we take the average over these ratios and then if I, if I would have a ratio of one half and another ratio of two, then we would like these two to cancel out. Okay, let's look at another example. This is actually the much better example. We compare these two computers on two benchmarks each. On benchmark one, computer A has a time of one second, and on benchmark two, ten seconds. And now with computer B, it's just the other way around. You have ten and one seconds. And I mean, everybody would say the result has to be one. They have to have the same performance figure. But now if we calculate S of CA comma CB, then we get 1 over 10 plus 10. This is the sum and then we divide it by 2 and we get 5.05. .05. Now if we do it the other way around, if we compare CB with CA, then we get 10 from here plus 1 over 10 divided by 2, which is the same. So my computer is faster, no matter which one is yours. So, so much about professional marketing, or should we rather say uh, perfect customer cheating? Yeah, let's look at, we would expect S equal 1. That's what we ex would expect. Huh? And now we can see the core of the problem. The core of the problem is that this 1 over 10 and the 10 here, they don't cancel out. We get 1 half of basically the 10 here, which is 5. Now what should we change in this formula such that these two guys cancel each other out? How about multiplying these two guys instead of adding? 10 times 1 over 10 is 1 and everything is fine. And that's why we now try to use the geometric mean of n numbers, which is nothing but the product. We don't take the sum any longer, we take the product of these numbers and then at the end we don't divide it by 2, we take um, the square root. So in case of two, um, two computers which we, uh, no sorry, in case of two benchmarks, we would take uh, the second square root, in case of n benchmarks, we take the nth order root. That's the definition of the geometric mean. Okay, and maybe at this point every salesperson would be, uh, the salesperson would be unhappy, but maybe every customer would be happy if you use this formula and would be satisfied but not a mathematician. 
Uh, and maybe even not a customer. Now let's look at, at uh, customers. We are now, but now we are not customers of computers. Now we are customers of mean functions. You want to buy the best function to average over these performance figures. And now we, we saw that the arithmetic mean is not good for our purposes. No, let's, step, let's go one step back. If you are the operator of your server, then the arithmetic mean is perfect. But if you are a normal PC user, then you want to go into the individual ratios and here the arithmetic mean is nonsense. We have seen it. So you know this product arithmetic mean is not good for you. And now I offer you a much better product. I offer you this, pro now I am the salesperson and you are the customer. You want to buy the better mean function. Yeah? No, not the better. You want to buy the best. The best mean function. And this is how it goes all the time. I mean, look, here I offer you the much better device. This geometric mean obviously solves the problem. Look, I have one tenth times 10 gives me a 1 and the square root of 1 is 1 again. And it's the same if we exchange our two uh, computers. So this is perfect. How much would you pay for this perfect uh, mean function? I would say this is worth 20,000 bucks. Huh? But when you, when you should pay 20,000 bucks, maybe um, you would ask which question? You would ask, is this the best product for me? Or is there a competitor who has an even better product? And now it's my task to prove that there is no better product on the market. And that's what we are going to do. And now what, are you, what do you do? Suppose you want to buy a new computer, a, a new digital camera, a new car. I mean, nowadays, you don't have to do so much work. You buy the favorite magazine, like for the digital camera. I know you buy color photo, and they make from time to time these tests. They test all the single lens uh, uh, reflex cameras um, and compare them all and then there is a winner of the test and you will buy the winner of the test because you trust in these guys and they do a good comparison. And now that's the point. That's exactly the point what we do now for our speed up function customers. What do they do? I mean, you know, in, in these tests, they do have such a, a table. And there is, I mean, here we have the products. P1, P2. And then here we have the criteria. C1, C2, C3. And down there, there is the baseline. And then we get here 20 points, and here 15 points, and here 31 points, and here 5 points, and 20, and 7. And then we have the sum here and the sum here. And you would buy the product with the best sum here. Huh? Yeah. You might even do it better because these tests, they are for the average consumer. You might really do your own test. So you buy these 20 favorite digital cameras, you buy them all. And then you install your test laboratory for your purpose. 
And then you would say, okay, for me is important this criterion and this and maybe C4. And I want to have a camera that gives me the full number of points, 50 points here and 50 points here and 50 points here. What will be the end of, of this story? You have your requirements. For example, criteria one, of course, is the price. The price should be zero. Of course, I mean, that's what you want. Huh? But the image quality should be perfect. The resolution should be high. The lens quality should be high. The usability should be high. Okay, what's, what's, what's the end of the story? There is no such product. There is no such product. For zero cost, you wouldn't get the perfect camera. That's obvious. So if your requirements are too high, too strong, then the set of possible solutions, and now we are back in mathematics, is the empty set. And this is not really nice. I mean, if my result is there is no speed up function for your set of requirements, this is frustrating. So maybe rather we want to have a speed up function that fulfills some requirements, but not all. If the number of requirements is too strong and too hard, then the set of solutions is the empty set. If my requirements are too low, maybe I don't get the, uh, the optimal solution. So if I say, okay, let's buy a camera which is cheap, and that's it. That's my only criterion. Of course you would get a cheap camera for like 30 bucks, but you could throw it away. It wouldn't make you good pictures. So the first step is you have to define your requirements. And that's what you do before you enter the media market. You will go to the salesperson and tell him, okay, I want a camera with this and this and this and this feature. Salesperson would say, there is no such product. Empty set is the solution. And then he would give you hints. You should modify your requirements in this direction. And then you would modify them. And finally, you would have requirements which give you exactly one solution. And then you would get, and this would then be the best product for your set of adjusted requirements. And now what we are going to do here, we want to have the perfect mean function. Um, I mean, there is already one product, but we don't know, is it perfect? Are there better products? Um, we now have to set up a number of requirements. And we will set up three requirements for such a mean function. And we will prove that the only one solution for this set of sensible requirements is the geometric mean. And I mean, this is perfect. My customer has to buy this product because it's a perfect, perfect product for his requirements. And now, of course, the critical point is the selection of these requirements. Yeah? And that's what in 19, around 1990, the authors of this communication of the ACM paper did. They set up three simple requirements for such a mean function, published them and proved that this is, uh, that the geometric mean is the only solution. And if, uh, yeah, I mean, if you look into the references of the script, oh, uh, sorry, I didn't, no, there were, there were no references yet. Ah, sorry, okay. You will see in the references, uh, there is one reference to a, a paper um, from the communications of the ACM. Okay, yeah. 
yeah, our, I mean, now we use the geometric mean and our new speed up definition, our favorite speed up definition is the geometric mean of all the ratios uh, of the times, which finally is the nth uh, root of the product of all the ratios. Okay, and it's easy to see that this definition solves our problem. I mean, before we compare it to other possible means, this mean solves this problem. Huh? Uh, sorry, uh, it's, I mean, it's actually this problem. For the geometric mean, we have the equality. So we, if we exchange the two candidates, then we will have just one over the previous result. And that's what we see here. S3 of CA and CB is the product of these ratios where we have in the enumerator the alpha car and in the denominator the beta car. And now we show that this is 1 over S3 of the two guys exchanged. Look, this is 1 over the product um, of the beta car k divided by the alpha k. Okay, but now let's uh, uh, look at this. This is the nth root of the product. I can pull this nth root into the product. And I can actually pull it onto the enumerator and the denominator. So then this is the product of alpha k to the power n minus 1 divided by beta k uh, to the power n minus uh, n over 1. Um, and now since this is a product, I can write it like that. I can write it like 1 over the product of the inverse ratios. Now we have beta k over alpha k. I mean that's basic, that's because, because 1 over 1 over x is equal to x. Huh? Or, I mean, we, we went this way. x is 1 over 1 over x. This guy here is 1 over um, the reciprocal of this guy. And it also involves the product. Of course, we can, I mean, we can say uh, x times y is equal to 1 over 1 over x times 1 over y. That's what we used here. Okay, so now we are here and now we do the same thing backwards again. This uh, beta to the power 1 over n, we can pull this out and this out and we get the nth square root of the product of beta k over alpha k and this is S3 which is now in the uh, denominator. Okay, so this problem 3 is being solved. Fine. But now let's go shopping. Now we have to set up our requirements. And the requirements these uh, authors published were these three simple requirements. Requirement number one. Remember, we are talking about a mean function. We are looking for a mean function. And now, um, I mean, there are books about mean functions. And one basic requirement, whenever you average over something, if you take the mean of many values which are equal, which are all equal to x, then the result has to be x. This is obvious, isn't it? I mean, if you have, for example, three people standing here and you want to uh, determine the average body size of these people, and they are all the same, they are all 1 meter and 75, then the mean should be 175. That's what we have here. So that's really trivial and basic. If this doesn't hold, um, we wouldn't call it a digital camera. Okay, now um, no, let's look at this, at the third property, because the second one is the most difficult. But the third is, is also easy. 
If I take the mean of some numbers x1 through xk, then it should not depend on the order. So if I take the, the mean size of these three people standing here, the result shouldn't depend whether I start with person 1 and 2 and 3 or the other way around. So m of x1 through xk should be equal to m of x pi of 1 up to x pi of k where pi is a permutation. Yeah? So we just permute the, the order of our numbers and then the result should be the same. It shouldn't depend on the order. So this is a trivial requirement too. And now here comes the critical requirement for our task. And this is m of x1 through xn times m of y1 through yn should be the mean so we, here we have the product, and this should be the mean of the individual products, x1 times y1 up to xn times yn. Okay, and, and uh, where does this requirement come from? Let's look closer into it. Now, we are looking for a mean function for our computer application. Huh? We are comparing computers with each other. Now let's go back to the example of three computers. Suppose we have our computer A on the desk standing and there is a competition product which is ten times faster. And then there is an even better product, a better computer, which is even two times faster than the second one. And then of course this computer C is 20 times faster than computer A. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really basic and obvious. Uh, I mean, if this guy takes 100 seconds to solve your problem and this guy takes uh, 10 seconds and this only 5, then this guy is 20 times faster. Yeah, um, but be careful. We are now talking about a set of benchmarks. For individual uh, benchmarks, if I take, take just one benchmark, then this property is trivially fulfilled because we don't do any averaging, we just uh, compute the ratios and then uh, this holds. And now we require our new speed up function. We are looking for this new product and this new product also has to fulfill this property because otherwise it doesn't really make sense to compare such products. For example, suppose computer A is 10 times faster than computer B but maybe 10 times slower than computer C. Then of course C should be the same as A. So we have a, a factor of 10 and then here we would have a factor of 1 over 10 and this should result into a factor of 1 again. That's where this comes from. So this should also hold for uh, averaging over benchmarks. Okay, so now we can write this down as a formula. The speed up of CA compared to CB here times the speed up of CB compared to CC should be the speed up of A compared to C. Yeah? So this 20 should be the product of these two. That's what we have here as a formula. And now, <coughs> now we decided to compute the individual ratios. So we are now looking for such a mean function. We don't know the function yet. We are looking for a mean function to average over these ratios. So if we compare A and B, then we have the alpha i divided by the beta i. And here we have B and C, so we have the beta i divided by the gamma i. And this should be equal to the speed up of computer A compared to computer C. 
So we, here we have the alphas divided by the gammas. That's what we want to have for, uh, for our mean function. And now look, yeah, we, we look at um, look at alpha 1 divided by gamma 1 and look at this and look at this. Then of course we can say that alpha 1 divided by gamma 1 is equal to alpha 1 over beta 1 times beta 1 over gamma 1 because here the beta 1 cancels out. So you see that this guy is a product of these two guys. Um, okay, so if this number is a product of these two numbers, then we can write it in a way if here we have x1 and here we have y1 and then this is x1 times, times y1. And now we, and this is property number two. So property number two is basically our multiplication property for speedups. Okay, is this clear? Okay, so, and, and I mean this is important. Now you can criticize. Uh, but as soon as you accept this, then you have to buy my product because these are your three modified requirements in the media market. Huh? And then of course the salesperson will offer you the best product for these three requirements. And the good news is there is exactly one solution for these three requirements. And here we have the theorem. The geometric mean is the one and only function m which fulfills these three requirements. And here comes the proof. Yeah, <coughs> I will do the proof here on the blackboard. What we have to show is that our m of x1 through xn is the geometric mean of x1 through xn. And this is equal to the nth square root of x1 times, times xn. That's what we have to prove. So we have to prove this equation. Okay, and uh, we don't prove this equation. We make an equivalent transformation. We say m of x1 through xn to the power n is equal to x1 times times xn. So we just take here the nth power and here the nth power. Huh? And because all these numbers, everything is positive, we don't have to worry about a minus sign on the fall, uh, of the square root. We now have to prove this equation using our three requirements. And here we have it. So we start with the left hand side. m of x1 through xn to the power n. I mean this is nothing but yeah, maybe we, I, I, uh, there are two steps missing here on the slides. Um, So we start here and this is m of x1 through xn times m of x1 through xn. I mean this is, this is basic. Yeah? And this is n times. It's an n-fold product of the same uh, number m of this. Yeah? And now we apply property number three. Property number three allows us to exchange the order of these x's here. 
So we start, yeah, we start with 1 or m of x1 to xn times, and now let's look, yeah, we start with x2, m of x2 up to xn. We do a cyclic permutation, so we take x1 and put it at the end times, and we do the next cyclic permutation until we end with the last permutation, which is, we have xn here, x1 up to xn minus 1. Okay? Yeah. Um, and now we apply our property number uh, number two. Look, if we multiply these two means, then we can write this as the mean of the product of x1 times x2, x2 of x2 times x3 and so on. So we can write this as the mean of the products of all the arguments. We do this for these two guys. Then we take the third one. In the first argument we then have x1 times x2 times x3. And we do this with all the products, so in the first argument we have the product x1 times x2 up to xn. So we get this is equal to m of x1 times up to xn. What do we have in the second uh, argument? It starts with x2 times x3 and so on up to xn and then comes x1. So you see we again have the product of x1 times x2 times up to xn, comma, and so on, x1 times xn. Yeah, look at the last argument. It starts with xn here, then x1 through xn minus 1, so we still have all these guys here. And now, what is the last step? We have now applied uh, our requirements number 3 and 2. So why don't we apply number 1 now? They are all the same. The arguments here, they are all the same. So then, you see this is equal to x1 times x2 times, times xn. Okay. And now we have proven this equation, and we are, right, we are finished. But, um, yeah, let's, let's ask this very last question. I mean, it's, I think it's obvious to you that this geometric mean fulfills all three properties. Huh? But now there is this other question. Why is this the one and only function that fulfills all these properties? There is there no other solution for these uh, three properties. It's simple. Look, this, look at this sequence of equations. We started with some arbitrary mean function, took it to the nth power, applied property number 3. And this means all mean functions, we didn't restrict it to something, all mean functions that fulfill property number 3 have to fulfill this equation. And all, all mean functions that fulfill property number 2 have to uh, be a solution of this equation. And all mean functions that fulfill property number 1 
um, um, our solution of this equation. So all mean functions that fulfill our three properties must fulfill this equation. But this is actually the definition of the geometric mean. So the geometric mean is the only solution. And I mean, this is perfect shopping. Huh? You go into the store with your requirements and then you get this one perfect product for your requirements. Huh? Okay, yeah, and we are finished now. Thank you.